Today we are here at Roanoke, Virginia's ever famous Grandin Theater, and we will be uh, interviewing Jason Garnett, the, what I call the man behind the scenes. So uh, uh, he's going to give us a little bit of a tour, and especially uh, the, the projection booth and anything else interesting that, uh, that you can come up with. T uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jason. How did you get started here at the Grandin? A friend of mine worked here, and I started as a janitor, of all things. I quickly moved to projection when my friend quit. Excuse me. And he trained me. That was about 1997. And I've been with the theater ever since. When the theater closed, I sort of was inherited by the foundation and became general manager then, and um, been here ever since. So, I, I myself was surprised to, to meet and find out who's behind the scene. I pictured like some guy about 90 years old, gray hair, uh, one of those old hats like John Lennon used to wear, just creeping around here on a cane. I didn't expect a guy. How old are you? I'm 29, 29. but I'll probably be here when I'm 90. I have a little <laughs> bit of gray hair and I definitely feel like an old man sometimes. Good. Well, let's go uh, maybe, what, check out the projection booth first? Yeah, I'll show you. We have four projection booths, but I'll show you the main one right now that has all the, uh, the cool stuff in it. Very good. All right, so now is, is, is projection booth, would that be what you would call this? Yeah, we refer to this one as the main booth. This is for the main auditorium. It seats 319 people, and this is where we do all the major first run and all the special events. Um, this is the projector here. It's a 35 millimeter projector. It has two different um, aspect ratios. We can show what's called flat or we can show cinemascope, which is a widescreen format. This right here is the sound head and we can read either optical sound or Dolby digital six channel sound. Um, right, right there, Jason. Now, you know, shooting. Uh, of course, I shot for years on 16 millimeter, right. and know what optical sound is. But a lot of people don't know what that is and find it quite amazing when they learn. Can you give us a little bit of education on what exactly optical sound is? I can. Um, the sound is actually photographed onto the edge of the film. I can show you some here in a second. Um, the best way to understand it, or the simplest way, is to think of a record needle and a groove on a record. Now think of that groove on the record as photographed onto a strip of film and instead of a needle it's a beam of light that's focused and that beam of light is bouncing around in the photographed groove and that's what's reading it here and then transmitting it over here to our sound rack that has a processor that takes that electrical impulse and turns it into sound waves. The, uh, what, what would you say with a 35 millimeter projector like this in theater, what's the, uh, what's the main thing that goes wrong? What's the biggest headache about one of these? Um, besides operator error, <laughs> the, uh, we run a platter system where the entire print it arrives on anywhere between six and ten reels. We have to splice each reel together to make a whole program. That plays off of one platter and it goes through a series of rollers, which I'll show you in a minute. And that's the biggest problem is something being threaded up wrong and essentially wrapping or getting hung up on something and the whole thing just falls apart from there. Um, in the old days, they didn't have platter systems, they had changeover booths where they would have two projectors and one projectionist would essentially change between reels. I'm sure you've seen the little cue dots that pop up about every 20 minutes when you're watching a film and that would tell the projectionist it's time to switch to the second reel or the third reel or the fourth reel. 
Well, we good. don't we don't necessarily do that anymore because since we have four booths, we'd have to have four projectionists. So we have to put everything onto a platter system, and one person, one projectionist, essentially runs four booths simultaneously. When you get a foul up or the film mess up or something like that, I can remember being a teenager and going to the movies or especially late shows, then everybody gets mad at the projectionist. And I remember, uh, not myself, I would never do anything like that, but people throwing cokes and stuff toward the projection yeah. booth. It, hey, do you have any a good story on that? <laughs> <laughs> you had stuff thrown at you? We have... <laughs> No, I haven't anything thrown at me yet, but uh, we try not to have any problems. That's how we avoid having stuff thrown well, at us. I'm going to throw something at you at the All next right. Late Show I come to. Well, okay. That's okay. So, <laughs> fair so enough. you haven't had people yelling? Uh, well, I mean, when that happens, people do get upset, and people, um, they'll see the film lock up in the projector and it melt. And some people think that there's a fire in the booth. The, back in the old days, again, pre 1950, the film was made out of nitrate and it was very flammable. And when it would melt on screen, it would actually light, ignite on fire in the booth. And uh, a lot of projectionists were killed and theaters burned down back in those days. After 1950, they came out with safety film, and it's, uh, it's not, a, not an issue anymore. But, uh, yeah, people, people throw stuff at the window every now and then. Yep. Not, we have a pretty well-behaved crowd, though. And I see behind you there is a, is a little window. I bet you get to watch some interesting stuff out there <laughs> sometimes, too, huh? Yeah, we see all kinds of stuff here, <laughs> and especially after the late shows or during the late shows. Um, and the upstairs booths as well. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much. No, right? that, be, that might be a good book, Memoirs of a Projectionist. Memoirs you, of could, a you could write that yeah, as a retirement project. I'm working on that on the side, my uh, copious free time. <laughs> well, what's next? Threading? Yeah. Um, threading, I can show you the, the platter system over here that we do okay. run the entire film off of. Step around here. This here is the platter system. And this is what an entire film looks like when it's all spliced together. This is Brokeback Mountain right here. And what we do is thread it up through the center here. It plays through the center, across here, through the projector, and then it'll rewind as it plays onto a separate platter system. Now, uh, Jason, being no stranger to cutting and splicing film, I looked over here and see a film splicer. So what in the world is a film splicer doing in a projection booth? Well, like I said, when we build up these programs for the entire movie, we have to take each reel and splice them to the following reel. And then we also have to splice in any previews or trailers that are going to play before the movie. Um, this right here is an example of what a trailer looks like when we, when we get it in. It's about two minutes worth of film here. And we have to cut the heads and tail leaders off of it and splice it onto the beginning of the movie. And that's what we use the splicer for. And this table here splicer sitting on is what we use to run a reel off of onto the platter system. Okay. Very good. And while we're uh, in this camera position, I mm -hmm. see over in the back there is the digital projector. Yep, that's a semi-new acquisition of the Grandin. We got a 4,000 lumen digital projector, which we can show pretty much any digital format film on. Um, we can also do PowerPoint presentations and hook computers up to it for uh, seminars and such. We also have a 35 millimeter slide projector over here too that we do on-screen advertising with in between shows. Mm -hmm. And are, are all those trailers stacked up over there? Yeah, those are upcoming movies and um, recent movies we've taken off. We Each movie usually comes with seven or eight trailers um, that we're supposed to put on the film. I know at the, at the big theaters you go to, you have about 20 minutes of previews, which is kind of annoying. So we try to shave that down to just the, the good stuff that people want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, well, people might like to know now, how do you go about, you know, that's, all, that's very big, mm -hmm. that, that film. And I've seen them arrive here in large metal, almost like uh, uh, octagon shaped suitcases. How does the theater, what, what's, give us a quick rundown of ordering a film. Like, uh, say, say, say Brokeback Mountain here, you got to get that from a big studio and they ship right. you what, one copy? They ship us one copy and we, we're renting the film. Renting the film. So we call the movie distributors that we deal with and we call them up and um, a lot of times if it's a big film, 
a first run film, we can usually get it on opening day. If it's something that's a small foreign film, it's harder to get because they don't make as many copies. And the few copies that they do make will play in the big cities first, and we're kind of far down the totem pole. Um, but they ship us the film in a, in a big box for a big two cans, about six to ten reels. Um, and when we're done playing the film at the end of its run, then we have to break it back down onto the reels and then ship it back to the film company. Okay, so you're renting it for a certain amount of time. Is right. there, are you at liberty to say roughly what the average, let, let's take like Wallace and Gromit. I saw you projecting the latest mm -hmm. Wallace and Gromit. What, roughly what does a movie run like that? To, how long do you rent it for first? Two weeks? Um, four weeks is, is probably a safe bet to say. Um, a four week run is about average. Um, sometimes if it's something like Napoleon Dynamite or something, we'll have it for three or four months. It's okay. just, it, it really depends on how well it's doing. Um, but four weeks is about usually the minimum time that we have a film here. And roughly what would a rental fee be? Well, it's a percentage of the box office. Okay, so, so it's a percentage of the door. You don't have to right. pay flat up front. There's, there's not a flat fee for the, the first run stuff we That's do. better. So it's it's a percentage. The percentages are usually pretty high, 70, 80 percent, but it, oh, wow. it fluctuates per week. Mm -hmm. So the longer you have a film, the less the percentages are. Okay. So. Well, let's. Uh, I think everybody wants to see this this baby threaded up and running. All right. All right. I can do that for you. This right here is called a center brain, and that is what the film will be threaded through on the platter here. I'll pull this ring out, and that's going to go onto the platter that I'm rewinding onto, essentially. So this brain has a micro switch in it, so as the film tightens around, it'll pull this arm and flip the switch, which will turn the motor on to the platter to turn, and then when the arm comes back, it'll turn the motor off. So it's constantly doing that the entire show, so the film doesn't wrap all the way around here really tight and break. Um, that we were talking about earlier, that's one of the bigger problems that can happen, or more common problems. This is just a leader we put on, about 20 feet a leader. see the ladder turn so it unwinds itself and then it'll stop so it doesn't wind itself the other way. this by hand but you'll see this is the very beginning of the movie here the beginning of the trailer right there and I'll step over to the projector head here I didn't mention before is we also have film cleaners up here. If we get an older film, an old uh, repertory film that's dirty, boogeyman, something like that, we can run it through here and clean it up, um, coat it, and so it'll play, uh, coat it with a lubricant so it'll play quieter and more stable on the screen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you zoom in, I can turn this projector by hand and you can see this gear here is just turning and mm -hmm. this one's turning. But this one right here, that's called the intermittent gear. And that's turning intermittently. And what that's doing, that's pulling four frame, or four sprocket holes per frame. So it's pulling frame, frame, frame. So for a split second, each frame of the picture stops in front of the film gate. So you're, it's doing that 24 times a second. And what that does is what's called persistence of vision, which is like a children's flip book where you flip a cartoon 
has the same thing it's doing there, and it's you're seeing the image flip 24 frames a second. Now, I can take this off. If you were just watching it flip 24 frames a second, you would see a bad uh, flicker in the picture. But these projectors come with shutters built onto them. And what that's doing, every time it pulls the film down to a new frame, the shutter blade covers that up. So your eye doesn't see that happen. So that eliminates the flicker. Very nice. So it's all about tricking your brain into thinking that the picture is moving on the screen. You're not just watching the film go through a box at 24 times a second. So line up the leader in the film gate. I'll close these gates up to hold it in place. So you got a loop of film here and a loop of film here on either side of the film gate and that loop will depend on the, the steadiness of the film. Right. All the picture on the screen. And almost like the inside of a, uh, of a film camera, that loop's pretty critical mm -hmm. being just about uh, some of the old Bolex cameras have a little loop guide to make yeah, sure the, so uh, the loop Just to make sure, because it's very critical, especially the camera, but especially on, on the screen to have a steady image. What else is critical is you get down here to the sound head and how the tension of the film going through the sound is very critical. If you have a two and it can be warbly, it'll sound like it's underwater. Can you show us the part of the film that has the sound on it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, pretty, I'm zoomed in pretty tight on the frame. Well, it's, it's not actually on here, but this strip right here represents where the sound would be. This is just the leader of the film, so right. there's no sound on it. But I can show you on another piece of film where, where that would be. This right here is a little fail-safe that um, if the film breaks for whatever reason, it has a kill switch in it, so it'll drop these rollers down and it'll cut everything off, so everything doesn't keep running if the film breaks and pull film out all over the floor. Okay, so now that it's all threaded up, just close up these doors, close the, uh, the lens turret here, and then we have to make sure it's the right aspect ratio and the right lens. Um, it's set right now for the correct aspect ratio, but if we have to switch it, we can just switch the lens around to a widescreen format. And switch the aperture plate here, and you're good to go for a CinemaScope feature. All right, I'll have to step around to the other side. So essentially it would be playing out of the center here, down around these rollers, then up through the projector, comes through the sound head, comes back to the platter, and rewinds onto a separate platter here. And there's various rollers in here to keep the speed constant, and it's, it's very uh, timed thing to keep everything running at a constant speed so you don't have anything tangling up or wrapping or maybe start. The lamp lights up. Gauser opens. This lamp in here is a uh, 2000 watt xenon bulb. It gets very hot, so we have to have exhaust fans constantly pumping the hot air out of the booth. In the summer, it still gets pretty uh, sweltering in here. Um, 
Once it started, then we checked the framing and we checked the focus. And check to make sure everything's running. Flatter's working appropriately, and that's about it. And then you go to the next uh, next booth and start the next one up. On a busy weekend, you have about five minutes in between shows to uh, to get four different shows started on screen. So, on busy weekends, our projections are running around crazed. This is a trailer for the Warriors, which we're showing as a midnight movie next Saturday, February 18th. Walter Hill classic, 1979. The projectionist and I and some of the staff collect old film trailers we like to splice on beginning of movies. Old concession trailers, cartoons. Just to give it more of that feel of an old movie house, kind of classic cinema thing. Make it a little bit different than the normal multiplex experience. kind of huge reel over here. What, what is this? Well, this is our film inspection table where we can put reels on here, run reel to reel, and inspect each one. We got a little light here. We can build movies up onto one giant reel. So a two hour program onto one whole reel. Take this off, put it onto a platter, then the reel comes apart and you can slide the whole movie off onto the platter that way. Or if we have to make repairs or anything, especially the older prints we get, classic films, we have to run them on here by hand and inspect every inch of it to make sure that there's not going to be any problems. Now here in the, uh, in the main theater, uh, Jason, is what I think everybody always talks about and admires is just the, uh, the architecture in here in the, uh, I think everybody kind of refers to them as gargoyles. They almost look like a, a type of an owl or something. You know anything about those? Yeah, they, they do look like owls, but in the original blueprints, they're referred to as uh, gargoyles. Um, they're original when the building was built in 1931. Um, an architect named John Zink, who built a lot of uh, movie houses up and down the East Coast during that time, built this theater. Um, and the gargoyles are original. Almost everything in this room is original to opening day, March 26, 1932, uh, including the uh, artwork over the proscenium arch here above the screen. Mm -hmm. That was restored during renovations. Um, originally, that artwork went the entire ceiling above us. Um, it was painted over sometime in the 1960s. Uh, I don't know why, but it was sort of recreated on the beams here during the renovations in, in 2001, 2002. Um, now these fake balconies, everybody always wants to sit in the fake balconies. Those are actually air ducts for the uh, HVAC system. Um, and they're just disguised cleverly as miniature balconies. Gotcha. I don't know if you can see inside them, we have starlights. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what they call atmospherics. Uh, architect named John Eberson in the 1920s invented that style for movie houses to uh, make it seem like you were outdoors sitting in an outdoor theater. Um, we've recreated them with LEDs instead of incandescent lights, but um, it's pretty much original. It's the exact same position where the stars were originally, and uh, I think it adds something special to the room. Yeah, I like it. Okay, well that's been a, a very thorough and uh, educational, a lot of background uh, tour of the Grandin Theater. 
with uh, Jason Garnett. Jason, where do you see theaters 10 years from now? I think there's always going to be theaters. Everybody wants to be social and come out to see movies. I don't think that's sort of widely debated now with digital versus film uh, becoming a popular thing. People will always want to go out to movie theaters. Um, I'm sort of excited about the digital projection becoming more popular. It sort of enables independent filmmakers to cheaply make their own movies and not have to deal with the costs and restraints of having to deal with movie companies and expenses for film prints. Um, so I can see there being independent theaters showing strictly independent filmmakers' product. Um, I'm very excited about it. Thank mm -hmm. you.